What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 76. This week, we got to talk to Easton Holder from the Outdoor Channel TV show, Raised Hunting. His dad actually started the show some 10 years ago, and we got into that on this podcast. We talked about what it was like growing up kind of on TV, especially when it came to hunting. We talked about some of the new products that they have coming up that they're coming out with producing. And, of course, we talked about the industry and kind of the TV industry as well within the outdoor realm. So it's a really cool conversation with Easton. He's an awesome guy to talk to. So I think you guys are going to enjoy this week's episode. But before we get into it, don't forget to support the podcast if you can. And one way you can do that is to check out our sponsors. As you guys know, Rodney Hawkins is a partner of the podcast, and he has been hunting Southern Illinois his entire life. Now he's putting that love for the outdoors into selling recreational properties as a land specialist with Midwest Farm and Land. Now, Midwest Farm and Land isn't your average real estate company. They sold over $85 million worth of ground in 2022. They've got agents like Rodney all over Illinois, so they're really a local company with a national reach. For more info on them, how to get your property listed, how to find any property you're looking for, you can contact Rodney directly at 618-925-3153, and he'll get you taken care of. He's also recently started a new company called RG Outdoors, and they've got hard and soft-sided blinds and blind chairs, all from Radix Blinds. They've got an all-natural scent elimination product called Camo Dust. They've got Burna self-defense weapons, and they've got Tacticam trail cameras. And they're coming out with new stuff all the time. So to keep up with them, go to their Facebook page, RG Outdoors. You can email them any questions at rgoutdoors at yahoo.com. Or again, just call Rodney directly at 618-925-3153. Our other partner on the podcast is Grandpa Ray Outdoors. The, they specialize in providing the best nutrition for white deer on your property, starting with the soil. They've got a full line of high-quality food plot seed and plant foods. They were started in 2015, but John O'Brien, the owner up there, has been in the seed nutrition business since 1991. With over 14 different food plot blends to choose from, you're not going to have any trouble finding what you're looking for, whether that be fall or spring blends, corn and beans, switchgrass, liquid fertilizer, soil test kits, anything you want for food plots, they've pretty much got it. And they're not just about selling their products or a fancy label or package. They'll answer any questions you have about what blends would be best for your specific property. That way you can achieve the best results possible. John and his team don't believe in a cookie-cutter approach to wildlife nutrition, so they're going to treat you and your situation individually. They're all about good quality seed and taking care of their clients. We've used their seed blends on client properties in the past, and the results have been as good as advertised. Of course, we planted them on our own properties as well, and we've been just beyond happy with the results from them. So that's why we partnered with them in the podcast in the first place, and that's why we're going to continue to do that and use their seed. If you guys want to get some of the best seed in the industry, go to GrandpaRayOutdoors.com, and if you want to support us, let them know you heard about them on the Ridge Hunter Outdoor Podcast by using the discount code RHO Podcast, no space, all lowercase, and get 5% off your order there. Again, you can check out our website too, ridgehunteroutdoors.com. Anything you see on there you like, use the discount code RHOPOD. That'll get you 10% off anything on the website, and that's all caps, RHOPOD. You can also follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave us a review on either one of those. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Like and comment on any of the videos on there. Check out our socials, uh, Ridge Hunter Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram. And then we do have a Facebook group now for the podcast listeners RHO podcast patrons and that's where we will tell you guys guests that we have coming up so you can ask them questions directly if you want to uh, we'll ask questions on there occasionally to find out kind of you know how we can make the podcast better and more suited towards you guys so go check that out it's RHO or Ridge Hunter Outdoors podcast patrons uh, actually I think I was right the first time it's RHO podcast patrons so you can check that out on Facebook as well answer a couple questions we'll get you in the group and you'll get some exclusive content and have some influence on what we do on the podcast. So, this week, Easton Holder, episode number 76. Let's get into it. This is the Ridge Hunter Outdoors Podcast. What's up, everybody? We've got Easton Holder here with Scott, Jeff. I'm Canyon Clark. Easton, how you doing, man? Oh, not too bad, man. Sitting out of the turkey woods for the day. So. Yeah, yeah. I saw you got one the other day with the bow, right? You guys doubled up? Yeah, actually, we had. Uh, that was a uh, hunt in itself, honestly. I've never done that in Iowa in 10 years. So Really? I've uh, yeah. I've been hunting turkeys for two years, and I am not going to try with a bow yet because I'm not even good enough with the shotgun to not screw that up. So. 
I tell you what, that they are an under, underestimated bird. No doubt. They're still a bird, right? But man, yeah. <laughs> for being as dumb as they are, they can they can get away from you pretty easy. Where you Did you say you guys are around Illinois? Is that what it yeah, was? Yeah, we're down in southern Illinois. So you have Easterns then, I take it? Yep, yep. Yeah, Easterns, in my opinion, seem to be quite a bit more intelligent than Miriams. I think they probably, uh, well, I, I don't know. They get a lot of pressure where we're at, and we don't have as many birds as we once did, too. So the ones that are around are getting hunted quite a bit. Yeah, that's uh, here in Iowa. That's what we deal with. Your first season, first and second season is pretty dang good. And then after that, it's just every day it gets a little harder and a little harder. But those right. Miriams, man, my dad just went over there earlier this week, and he has a video of four or five different toms sprinting as fast as they can at the decoys and stuff. They were calling them in left and right. No kidding. <laughs> I guess there's a lot of birds out there, too, probably. There is quite a few. I think their numbers are actually, they're saying they're down right now, but they're uh, they're still a lot. Yeah, how are your guys' numbers up in Iowa? Uh, To be honest with you, I think the majority as a whole of Iowa would say they're probably about average. I think I've heard some people say they're a little low. Um, But as far as where we're at, so my dad started, this is kind of a test we did on our own, but Mm -hmm. um, he started trapping two or three years ago. Mm Mm-hmm just around his area, around his house. Well, between two years, he had killed like two or 300 coons. Oh, yeah. And so we thought, I wonder if this will make a direct impact. Well, the following year, we had like a group of 10 or 12 jakes running around, Mm -hmm. a couple other uh, groups of jakes and everything. And then this year we had what he had a group of 17 or something like that. Sweet. And so it's like immediate almost that – we're seeing a difference around us. That's what we'd talked to Forrest. Well, gosh, it's probably been close to a year ago now. Forrest Bonin from Drury Outdoors. And he was talking to the same thing. He said they started doing a lot of trapping maybe a couple years ago, two, three years ago, and noticed an immediate difference the next spring. It's just the the nest predation and the number of raccoons that there are out now is crazy. Yeah, for sure. And, I, I mean, you can get into a whole bunch of other things, too. Oh, yeah. Like our main thing is, is coons around here. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think that they may have. I'd have, I'm going to have to read up on it. I saw somebody shared it that um, I guess they just legalized coons in Iowa year round. Really? That's, so that, that's a positive. I would imagine, uh, yeah, I would imagine that they're starting to realize how many there are and how few, or I guess our trapping numbers are way down now mm-hmm. that the market's pretty awful. So Yeah, there is no market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's about accurate. Yeah. I wish uh, Illinois was half as proactive as Iowa is when it comes to the DNR. But yeah. we we kind of have a combination of, like a lot of other places, lack of habitat or diminishing habitat, and then the coon numbers are just through the roof because, like you said, no one traps anymore. No one runs dogs. And then we're getting a pretty decent number of bobcats now too. So even the young ones, they're putting a hurt on a number of those, even the ones that make yeah. it out of the nest, you know. I don't know if you guys are That's... seeing any of that yet or not. Well, I, I'll tell you right now that I hunt a – piece of property primarily what i hunt for like uh whitetails and turkeys is just a piece i have permission on mm-hmm. and i've been hunting that for four or five years maybe gotten a a picture here and there of a bobcat in the past year i had vi- multiple videos of a mom with four cubs or kittens i don't mm-hmm. i guess i don't even know which one they call them but right. and then two two or three other bobcats like big bobcats that are all completely different yeah and so do you guys I'm have a, that a lot. do you guys have a season for them in Iowa? Yeah, but it's kind of janky to be honest with you. It's like uh, I want to say it's like second or third week of after our bow season starts, which is October first. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you, and you have to have your trapper's license, and then they only go. It only goes for like a month or a month and a half. Wow. Um, and it seems to be every single time you go sit in a stand, it's they come by mm-hmm. before they're open on the season and then after. So yeah, right. So. So you can still shoot them with like a bow or a firearm. You still have to have your trapper's license or you have to trap yeah, them? Yeah, you can. No, you can shoot them with a bow or a firearm or something while you're hunting or if you wanted to go out, but you just have to have a trapper's or a fur bearer's license is what it's called. Huh. We're actually on a draw system right now. And of the however many umpteen guys I know that put in last year, one one of my buddies got drawn. And everybody I know that, that goes out and coyote hunts and calls – Said, man, if you get a tag, let me know. I know where we can go get you a bobcat. I mean, there's just there's that many of them around. It's just we're not. So they do a draw for it, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's a lottery like they used to do mm-hmm. for deer. Yep. There's a pretty limited number of tags. 
Uh, I'm hoping it'll go up in the future, but again, Illinois doesn't tend to be the most proactive. Even though, yeah, I did. You would think that would be a revenue stream that they might want to tap into a little more, since that seems to be their main priority. But yeah, no kidding. Uh, they haven't yet, so we'll see. I did not know that there was any states that were doing a a draw for a bobcat tag. So that's yep. a new one for me. Yeah, they're still this. The hunting of them is still new enough that they're still doing it by a draw, which I think the population is going to beat the state to the point where they need to just do like an over-the-counter thing or give out, you know, do one permit for everybody that wants one kind of thing. Yeah. But we'll see. I think here in Iowa, I don't, it's not like you, now I could be wrong, but I don't think you can just kill however many. Right. I, I want to say it's, it's pretty limited because I know that if you do, if you are to kill one or something while you're hunting, you got to get a hold of the DNR and then a uh, warden will either, issue you a tag for it or they'll come meet you kind of thing Mm -hmm. um and you actually have to get it tagged like you would uh it's a different kind of tag but it's just like you would a whitetail or something right that way they can maybe keep track of them a little more i guess yeah i would imagine so yeah so before we get too far into anything else let's talk about how you kind of got started hunting and i guess it's kind of obvious but for those of you (laughs) for those that don't know about you or raised hunting or what you guys started out as, which was uh, above the rest, I believe. Is that uh, right? Uh, how in the heck did you know that? <laughs> hey, man, I, he does his research. Yeah. Give him that. Goodness gracious. Okay, so. I have not heard somebody else say that name in probably 15 years. That's been a minute, ain't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so before even before that, was it your dad that got you into hunting originally? And what did you start with? Did you start with like whitetails, turkeys, squirrels? What was it? You're going to be surprised because, okay. uh, so he's been, he's, he's been hunting for like 40 years now, but mm-hmm. he put a bow in my brother and I's hand when we were two years old, he <laughs> went and took, uh, a Walmart bow yep. and bought like aftermarket strings that you'd get on your regular bow and put them on that so mm-hmm. that it would at least have enough power for us to stick in the target. Right. Um, and so we were shooting since we were two, he was carrying us around in backpacks and everything. And Man, you I must have born... been a stud two-year-old pulling that thing back. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I got it to shoot. But. Right, right. Um, so we, we, I mean, we we grew up in Montana, is where me and Warren primarily. I was born born in Montana. Warren was born actually in Arkansas, but okay. we only lived there for like six weeks. But so in Montana, we had, I mean, just about any animal or creature you could think of to hunt out there. Oh yeah. Um, but, but they don't allow you to hunt until you're twelve. So okay. you can, you can get your, like your hunter's ed, your bow hunter's ed and everything quite a bit younger, mm-hmm. but you can't actually hunt until you turn 12 in Montana, which was kind of janky in my opinion. Even I, with I an adult? It, but you could... Even with an adult, huh. you know? And so my dad started us originally when we turned 10. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if there's a limit anymore, um, but Nebraska, when you were 10 back then, you could, as long as you were 10, you, that was their age limit, you'd go uh, as a non-resident and mm-hmm. shoot some turkeys. And so we would go down there and, uh, it was like, oh my, it was so cheap. You'd get three tags for a youth for like maybe 40 bucks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we, we basically just knock on doors, hunt public or something like that. And so my first ever animal with a bow was a turkey. Really? And then, yeah. So we did that. And then once I turned 12, we, uh, it's people think it's crazy, but when you actually kind of break it down, it makes sense. The first big game animal I ever hunted was a black bear. Okay. Um, and so uh, it's not as intimidating as you'd think, but right, it's, right. It, when you really think about it, so we went to Canada and that's over bait. Yeah. And so for a young kid trying to learn the, uh, tips and stuff of when mm-hmm. to move and when you can draw and stuff like that, it's a extremely controlled environment. Yeah, for sure. And so it's, it's some people are like, Oh my gosh, you shot a bear for your first big game animal. <laughs> right. And then you think, think about it for a second. You're like, okay, a bear was a heck of a lot easier for me to start learning on as opposed to a whitetail. when I'm only going to get a couple opportunities. For if sure. that. Yeah. So, and they're not as wired uh, and like in, I mean, they're in tune, but you know, they're not, yeah. you're not less likely to spook them potentially when they're sitting oh. there eating gummy bears or whatever it is. Oh yeah. It's pretty hard to get them to go away from what <laughs> they like. So. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I mean, that's where I originally began from turkeys to that, to, then we moved when I was 12, we moved to Iowa and from there it's, 
oh my whitetail central mm -hmm. whitetail mm -hmm. heaven basically so so you killed a turkey and a black bear with your bow before you ever killed a whitetail yeah yeah yep. <laughs> and i never i never even got which really kind of chaps me a little bit but i never actually got a hunt in montana no kidding because right, right when i turned 12 it was summertime and uh we moved down here to iowa and i never got the opportunity to hunt anything out there uh, gee thanks dad <laughs> yeah that's what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> right so can't be too mad though right no doubt so was that about the time that the show started what what time frame are we looking at now so you moved to iowa you're around 12 years old when did he start filming and getting into the industry so he was technically i mean so we just we're going to be releasing an episode here his first year or first episode we've ever done kind of showing where he began and that was back in 96 Okay. And he was, uh, he actually got a hold or Primos got a hold of him mm -hmm. because at the time he was, I guess it would have, yeah, it would have been right in 96. Uh, they just moved to Montana and he was successfully killing an elk every year mm -hmm. on uh, national forest or public, whatever. And at the time it was pretty unheard of. It's still right. a heck of an accomplishment if you're killing an elk every year with your bow. No doubt. And um, so they got a hold of him and he actually started traveling like the what primarily western states doing seminars elk seminars and everything mm -hmm. and uh he was filming some of their stuff and he was a firefighter at the time well once he retired was i don't know early like 2006 or seven somewhere in there mm -hmm. and wanted to start a show and so just because that was his dream was to share what it was like raising his kids in the woods right and the absolutely embarrassing, disgusting name that you just threw out there a minute ago, <laughs> uh, above, um, above the rest outdoors is where we originally started. Yeah. Um, yep. And it was a local show and everybody, it, did not, it was a terrible show. It was nothing different. <laughs> um, terrible quality. And uh, uh, everybody took that name as we were saying that we were above the rest. Right. And <laughs> the anticipation was that. No, we're an arrow sits above the rest. Right, and so we didn't we didn't think that one out. Not a lot of foresight well, on that one. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but 2012, we when we got the opportunity to move to or move to Iowa, we're like you know what, if we're really going to do this, why don't we do it the right way? Get the view or the vision of what we have, and actually get it out there. Mm -hmm. So we moved here. We changed names. We came up with race hunting. We went national. We got a different uh, camera guy and editor that really took all my dad's views, everything that he was thinking and envisioning, he put in a life. Mm -hmm. And uh, fr from there, it's been, we're going into our 10th season now and we've gone through some pretty big changes and stuff, but I mean, we're, we're still at the core. We're th that family hunting show that everybody knows right. because of that. Right. So did you guys, when you moved to raise hunting, did that start on the outdoor channel or was that with a different, uh, no, network? That, yeah, that went straight to the outdoor channel. Okay. And cool. I want to say for that first year's outdoor channel after that, it went to, uh, we stayed on outdoor channel obviously, but then we went into like wild TV and stuff, which is Canada. Um, and then a couple different international programs that would get us just about everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we actually, we did, we did spend a year or two on discovery channel there for a little bit. Oh, cool. Um, but now we're back on outdoor channel. So, right. Right. So what was that like for you growing up kind of in your, I guess teen years or whatever, basically on the outdoor channel every fall. Uh, it, it was weird. Yeah. <laughs> I say weird because there was, there was a lot of good and there was a lot of bad. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because when you're at that age, you go to school, first off, we, the amount that we moved as kids, me and my brother learned real quick that we better be good friends with each other because when you move, <laughs> you don't have anybody. Yeah. That's all you got. Um, but especially when you move into a new small town and everybody knows who you are right away because everybody does their research on who's moving into town mm -hmm. and who's they the new kid? know that you, yep. And they know you have a TV show. So then automatically they put you in a category of you're a piece of crap or yep. this yep. or that. And they don't like you and all these different things. And you're going to steal the girls. So the, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it was that easy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, now, come on, man. <laughs> I, I, I wish it was. I would have said I was on a TV show a lot more often. <laughs> um, so the, the, that was the bad part of it as far as they, I guess that was the tough part. But at the same time, as long as they gave us a chance, we're pretty down to earth people. Right. And so it just took time for us to kind of start settling in. But after that, it's 
the amount of support and stuff going through high school and everything like we a lot of the stuff we film we need to have some real life type footage and because it's not just solely hunting and so the school was great like we we would call them and say hey we're trying to do an episode about easton doing this and we, we may need some footage or something of him and some classmates in school or something and they were great about it and they would yeah. let us come do that and stuff and so it was uh it was really, really odd, especially because like sports and stuff, mm -hmm. coaches didn't understand. Like I would, I would tell them like, Hey, I'm going to be gone for a week during right. the summer to go on an antelope hunt. And mm -hmm. they're like, okay, well, sorry, but you're missing out on practice. You have to make it up and stuff. I'm like, I get it. I'll make it up, whatever. But they didn't understand that. Okay. This isn't like me just saying screw football. Right. I want to do it. This is right. pretty much like, this is my family's job and lifestyle. So yep. Yep. it's your livelihood choice here, but yeah yes yeah, so there's there's some growing pains and stuff with it but all in all looking back on it now i'm i wouldn't i would never change anything about it yeah did you ever have a point where you were kind of burnt out with it or you thought this isn't what you wanted to do or was it always pretty much i'm gonna keep doing this like i and you always enjoyed it that kind of thing oh no 100 percent, i burned out yeah yeah <laughs> i uh i mean we were doing it so much and it was to the point and it's not a not necessarily a bad thing but at the time it was every weekend, like I played a lot, I played quite a few sports and I was pretty involved in school and stuff. So I was really busy with that, let mm -hmm. alone every weekend. If I wasn't at a game or something, I was hunting. Right. And so I'm, as a kid, I really didn't have a ton of time to go like, Hey, I'm going to go hang out with my friends kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I graduated, I immediately was like, all right, when I turn 18, I'm, I'm dipping out, I'm moving out. I'm going to go do my thing and see what, see what I really do enjoy about life or what my passions are and just, just kind of get the understanding of myself a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I went and did construction for a little bit. Um, that'll make you want to go back I, to hunting. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, I actually did not mind it. it really? Was, I mean, it's, it's tough work and we, I was having to lay pipe every day. So yeah. we were digging a lot of crap and stuff like that, but it was, I actually thoroughly enjoyed just the work aspect of it just because mm -hmm. I like hands-on things, but, mm -hmm. um, I did that and then I was still hunting like a little bit here and there, but as I wanted to and not having to film it or anything. Yeah. And then, uh, I actually started my own photography company, um, just cause all the, I had, I had the knowledge and the ability to do it, do so after mm -hmm. filming a TV show and stuff. So I did that for about a year or two and started going back and hunting with my family and stuff and just kind of getting involved with them again. And then about a year ago, I was like, you know, I'm like absolutely obsessed with hunting now that I'm like actually understanding who I am as a person and getting to know myself. Mm -hmm. And so me, my brother and my dad all decided, well, Hey, we've, we've all hunted combined over 60 70 years right and we all have like literally if we sat down and did it which we did we have over hundreds of different inventions and different things that would help the hunting industry or this product that needs to be made and stuff right and we're like you know what why don't we if we all want to do something together let's we'll keep the show and stuff because it has a really good following and a really good fan base and very mm -hmm. loyal fan base but let's start doing our own products and everything and so last year we released our first uh whitetail scent lures mm -hmm. so it was it's all glandular scents and everything mm -hmm. and so when we started that now it's been about a year that us three have been i've been back in the swing of that and people at, like i used to like in high school i wouldn't tell people that i had my like, i would ask what my parents do and i would just tell them what my mom did <laughs> and then tell them my dad's a retired fire department fire <laughs> yeah, right. i would just like to keep that aside but now right. it's when people ask i'm i'm extremely proud to say well, i'm i'm a part of race stunning we do this and this and this mm -hmm. and so yeah, there's definitely times where uh, it was a big question of, do I even want to hunt? And now you can't find me anywhere not in the woods if I'm not at work doing something. So. Right. Yeah. And that's probably good that you even went out and kind of did your own thing for a while and got a little bit of different perspective on not just the the hunting part and what your dad's doing, but like maybe yourself and then what you wanted to do and the, the world in general, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. I I needed it really, really way more than I even knew at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, it, I mean, not that it I didn't get tons of experience. I mean, I didn't do it for two, three years, but right. it was enough to understand. Like, okay, I like to do this, and I like to do that, and it's not because I have to or because I want to or whatever. It's because I genuinely enjoyed it and I'm passionate about it. So. Right. Yep. For sure. So, 
what what do you guys got? You got anything coming up new? You said you're you're coming out with the tenth season. Uh, you're doing your your lures, your whitetail scents. Is there anything else on the horizon, or yeah, that you guys are kind yeah, of we actually getting out there? A really, really, we have a big one coming out, and we're going to be releasing it here in uh, here pretty soon, actually. Okay. Um, and what that is is a brand new climbing stick. For, okay. Like your mobile hunters. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the first stick to ever be telescoping or anything, mm-hmm. and so basically you get. I mean, your typical package of climbing sticks, you get three sticks, they're 32 inches, something like that. Yep. And you got to try to stack them and throw them on your back. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we were sick and tired of mainly Warren had started, he was doing a lot more of the mobile hunting for certain deer. He's like, this is ridiculous having to walk in here and do this. And with all this crap on my back. And so he actually came up with telescoping mm-hmm. and if, I mean, he took a lot of prototypes with it, but um, basically what it does is all three of those sticks, they have movable steps. And so they slide into each other. So you have one, one 23 inch stick that's all combined. That weighs just barely seven pounds. You, you can throw that on your back and it is literally like the most simple form of a climbing stick I've ever touched. Yeah. That's and what you need. So yeah, it's, it's just solely in the fact of being easy to pack around and get into places and still get you to the heights you need mm-hmm. is a game changer, let alone like we did a couple things like we have offset strap hooks. So we have a, instead of the strap, like where you hook your straps on the stick, it's not just both in the center and level, right? We have one above and one below. And so that what that does is when you strap that to the tree, it cannot kick out whatsoever. So right. like you can, you strap that out in a lot of sticks. If you pull on the bottom step when you're climbing up or something, sometimes it'll come away from the tree. Yeah. Might uh, have you, done that a time or two. <laughs> yeah. Me, me too. <laughs> and we did not like that. It's not a good and feeling. I'll, I'll tell you right now. You, I don't know if you guys have ever met Warren, but he is not a small person. <laughs> okay. He's a pretty, pretty big boy. And yeah. I've watched him freaking yank on those things as hard as he can and cannot get him to kick out. Yeah. And so we've added, there's a lot of different things that are to it and that. You, get, it, you guys should definitely check it out, but it'll be under, uh, we partnered with one of our buddies that we met that was doing something very similar. We work together on it now. And so we're releasing it as hype and okay. it's hype innovation outdoors. Um, and so those, that is our, right now our bread and butter. We're, we're pumped for that one because I think that people are going to see that and especially with how large mobile hunting is at the moment. Oh yeah, so. for sure. I th- we've, we've actually talked to, I don't know, four or five out of the last few guests we've had on have been public land guys and it seems like yep. that that i don't know demographic right now is just growing and growing and it's becoming a lot more popular and you see the public land guys getting a lot more popular and i think some of that probably has to do with like the hunting public and their popularity and guys kind yep. of you're seeing more shows that have to do with that more podcasts about it and then a lot yep. of that is like your mobile setup hunters that you're talking about and that's it seems to be really popular and that even that setup is becoming a lot more popular than what like the summit Viper climber stands were, you know, kind of when I was growing up. Yeah. But like me as my style of hunting is like, I like to have my stuff there and Mm -hmm. and good. And like, I'll, I'll go throughout the summer and I'll set, I'll spend as much money as I have to on getting those stands and everything and get them set and where I want them Mm -hmm. so that I can just walk in and kind of do my thing and not have to worry about anything. And so when they started coming up with some of these ideas, I'm like, yeah, this is awesome for somebody that's moving around and wants to have different setups. Yep. And then I started using it and I'm like, man, I, this isn't even my style of hunting. And I'm telling you right now, I would buy this solely so I could have a setup where I can move and be yeah. comfortable moving. Cause right now I just, I just make myself pack a hang on and three sticks, four sticks. and I just deal with it. Right. <laughs> yep. So whatever it is, it is right. Yeah, that's just what yeah, you do. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. I'm kind of the same way with you as far as like putting the stands up and I'll leave them in the spots that I know because I'm hunting private ground and I've been hunting the places that I'm on for years now. So I kind of have a good idea what's going on. And I'll yep. go in and just, of course, check the straps and everything every year. But the reason I kind of got to that was because I got so tired of lugging around the climber all the time and big bulky and all that. And yeah. You know, I never thought, uh, well, I should come up with something to make this easier. I just thought, well, I'll buy something that's already out there and and hang it up and, and leave just it. Deal with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. 
Well, I, I have never actually, I mean, I've climbed with climbers before, mm -hmm. but here in Iowa, I mean, the theory of a climber to me, I'm like, dang, that'd be great. Right. But I, I'm not going to find a freaking tree that I can get a climber in. That that's the other 17 thing. limbs to cut. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's the other thing. It was always like, well, there's, this is where I really want to be, but that tree over there is going to be a lot easier to climb. And then you end up being yep. 20 yards from where you really wanted to be a lot of times, yep. you know, yeah, and a cli climber I'm, makes I'm, you mobile, but it makes you limited mobile. Yeah. A hundred percent. I get so much crap because when, when some of these guys come and hunt with me, they know <laughs> that I am of the theory of where I want my stand and where it needs to be, that's where it's going. Right. So if the tree doesn't work, it's going to work. And we're going to make it work. <laughs> yeah. So some of this stuff is not very conducive to get into, but I'm mm -hmm. sitting here like it's in the right spot. So I'm going to take it. I'll sit really uncomfortably if I have to, to, right. to be, to be in the right area. Yeah. We've talked about that a lot, actually. And I think we did a whole episode on uh, like unusual kind of stand placement because the location that you need to be is a lot more important than the tree being perfect. And yep. uh, Nate talks, he tells a story about this tree that had, I don't know, four or five different trunks on it. And he just, he really liked the tree, even though it wasn't in a great spot. So he did everything he could to get up in that thing. And he never killed any deer out of it just because it wasn't in the right spot. Whereas you could go maybe yep. climb, even if it's hanging 10 feet off the ground, if it's in the right spot, that's going to do you a lot better than being 25 foot in the wrong tree. 100%. Especially if you can trust yourself with, I mean, you can get away with a lot if you know when to move and how mm -hmm. to move and things like that. So mm -hmm. when did you, so was it pretty early on that you started learning that kind of stuff? Because obviously again, you have your dad who's got all this experience hunting and all that. And maybe he was able to relay some of that information, but I think there's a pretty steep curve for a lot of people that are getting into hunting new and we are getting, seems like some more new hunters, but as far as learning all that stuff, so was it pretty, like, did you pick up that stuff pretty quick out there hunting black bears and stuff and then moving to hunting absolutely whitetails or not. was it <laughs> absolutely not? Okay. Yeah. So you're like everybody else then. Yes. I mean, if you take like we, some of the stuff that we've talked about on our podcast as well, is like you, you'll take everything my dad has done and mm -hmm. he, he, I mean, it's so long and so, so many years that you can't even get through everything of everything he's learned. But then you take like my brother, for instance. You, you compare me and him together and he, he clicked way, way earlier than what I did. Like he, he was so passionate about hunting and everything and learned it so quickly that I would put him in the classification of a, a very great hunter and very good at what he does. Mm -hmm. Like when he was 14, he was really good at it. Right. Me on the other hand, I'm sitting there. I wouldn't even start putting myself in that realm until I was 18 or 19. Yeah. Simply because I just, it, certain things hadn't clicked with me. Certain things weren't like I was, I don't know. I just, I think some people just takes a little bit longer of in different types of experience to does, yep. get to that level. And I, my big thing for me, and I preach it and preach it and preach it to everybody I talk to is anybody getting any into new is obviously be, be a sponge and learn from anybody you can and take things with a grain of salt. Like you'll test things and you'll hear certain things that are whack, but you got to learn those things through experience. No but doubt. number one that makes you, in my opinion, one of the best hunters possible is understanding the animal's body language. Mm -hmm. And that for me, once I started like, okay, if I know their body language, I can get away with getting there anything I want to do as long as I can see them. Yep. And that is where it clicked for me that I was like, okay, now everything's starting to make sense because I'm getting away with certain things. I'm making shots where I never would have even gotten a full draw and, all sorts of different things. Right. That's, uh, well, with any wild animal, but especially whitetails, that's huge, where you start to learn, like you're talking about, the little tail flicks and where how they got their head, how they're walking and their ears and all that kind yep. of stuff. And that makes a big difference yep. whenever you're like me and I hunt on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. so you, you have to really pay attention to what that animal's doing before you even think about pulling the shot off on them. A hundred percent. Yep. Well, and I'm not in I'm not in a ground too. blind either. And you know, I'm not in a that's, ground blind. I'm sitting on a That is absolutely ridiculous. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And but I'm fifty three years old and not in the best of shape. I really don't feel like climbing up in trees and stuff anymore. And I like to be more mobile, you know, and Yeah. I gotcha. And it's a lot more challenging whenever you're sitting Well, I'm there telling on, you right now, I once I get to the point of I've accomplished a lot of things, then I'll start screwing with that. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I can still screw it up 20 foot off the ground just fine. Oh, yeah. Yep. It's pretty easy to. No doubt. No doubt. And even not only just 
like you're talking about getting to the point of getting to the shot, but then making the shot and all that stuff, oh, you yeah. know, I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. And I think that that yeah. probably is why there is such a steep learning curve with it, because as soon as you think you got something figured out, you screw up something else and then you got to figure it out. Yep. And, and sometimes when you do screw that one thing up, it's hard to figure out what it is. Yeah. Like, yep. You might mess something up and not even know what it was. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like there's certain things that are cut and dry. Like, okay, I just shouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. And then other things that you're breaking every bit of it down. You're like, I did everything right. I still can't figure out why it didn't work. Right. Right. So this yeah. is, you said you're kind of a sports guy. Um, yeah. Did you ever use your hunting film as like game tape? Like if you mess something up, go back and look at it and think, okay, what went wrong or what didn't I see that the camera might have or, or something like that? I have for, so uh, it depends on which kind of angle we had. Cause a lot of times like we'll, we'll put a GoPro or when we were younger, we put GoPros in and now we've used a lot of the tactic cams, um, like their wide angles and stuff. Mm-hmm. We put them in the tree facing us and right. we've had multiple times where one to settle arguments and two, <laughs> we go back and watch like, why did that deer ever look at us or why, what, what did I do? Or was my form really bad when I shot or something? Mm-hmm. You can learn a lot from that. But at the same time, you learn a lot from simply filming it in the first place. Being able to understand where you actually hit as opposed to where you think you hit yes. is huge, especially just in the tracking stage, but also for moving forward. If you do make a, a marginal shot. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I watched a lot of it. We've had like when I, you guys laugh at when I say so arguments, we had, I don't know. He ended up being probably one of the biggest deer we've ever had in our entire lives for any of us. Um, come in when I was like 14. So I wasn't even, I was not, I never passed deer until like last year. Mm -hmm. And so I would shoot anything that came in. And of course this freaking monster comes walking in and I'm like freaking out because I, I couldn't even fathom how big it was. Right. And, uh, he's well below us because the way that the stand was set was we're on the edge of a Creek bank. And so from where the stand was to where he was, it was about 30, 35 feet probably down mm-hmm. just because of the, how the bank laid. Right. And he's walking out of nowhere that far below us, just picks his head, looks right at, at us, stares at us and runs off. And my dad automatically is like, what you had to move. What were you doing? Uh-huh. Like, Dude, I swear to, I swear I was, I was leaning against the tree, not moving at all. Wasn't his he fault. Goes, well, I didn't move it? either. <laughs> well, then we had to go look at the, the footage and we look back at the footage. And we're like, no, neither literally neither of us even moved a muscle. Mm-hmm. That deer flat out picked us off somehow. And just that caught actually, something never, that was different or something. I, I'm pretty sure he died of old age. Yeah, that's never, how you get that I big, mean, right? Yeah, we never got close to, we got close to him once or twice, but mm-hmm. other than that, like not anywhere close within bow range. Right, right. Yeah, I have so. no idea how many deer when I was probably 10 to 15, 14 that I missed that were just huge deer, even before I was like you passing deer, but they would come yeah. by and then I would just be in the right spot and fling an arrow at them and miss maybe two times occasionally. And now it's like, you know, I'm to the point where I'm, I'm passing deer and been that way for a while and trying to grow mature deer and wait for the mature yep. ones. And then, you know, it's like they come around once every, I don't know, 40 or so sits, you know, yep. and, and then no, you see one and then it's, you got to make that perfect shot. And that's a whole other thing in itself too. Yeah. People don't understand how, like, if you do get some of these deer that are a more mature whitetail, whether they're big or not, getting one of them within range if you do it once, then the chance of them happening multiple times is extremely, extremely slim. Yep. If you don't get it done that first time, uh, and you spook them, then and even if you don't spook them, you know, like you said, the chances of them coming back and and you have another chance at them are, are pretty slim, especially depending yeah, on where you're hunting. Yeah, it's tough to get them to do the same thing twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mature deer, buck, or doe. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. Then, then those, <laughs> me and them have history. There's, there's definitely something here that I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll just real quick. We had a guy that we're working with. Uh, his name's Rodney Hawkins. He's a local guy and he's, he's doing his own outdoor shop now and he's got some new products he's trying out and he's got this one product called camo dust and it's supposed to be a sin elimination product. So we're like, okay, you know, we'll try it out. We're working with him. We said, we've got the perfect guy to try this out with because, Jeff, if there's a mature doe within, I don't know, a quarter of a mile, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she is going to find Jeff, and she's going to smell him. Yep. She's going to get downwind of him, and she's going to blow at him. So it doesn't matter where he sits. 
what woods we're hunting, if there's a mature doe around, she's going to find Jeff. So if this camo dust stuff is any good, I mean, if it can keep Jeff from getting smelled by a deer, I mean, he's got something. You I'm going to buy stock that you in want. It. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, did it work? We haven't tried it yet. We just got it. We're going to, oh. we just got it, I don't know, a few weeks ago or something. So we're going to try it this coming season. I'm Fair really, enough, I'll be interested to hear that one. Yeah. <laughs> we'll let you know. I'm really excited. Uh, you hit on the glandular sense. Uh, you know, I talked to your dad quite a bit. Well, I went to his seminar there at Iowa and, and uh, I talked to him quite a bit after his seminar and stuff. And I'm really excited. I bought a bottle of that and I'm going to try that on making mock rubs. Yeah. So it is, it's a ton of fun when you, I, I have spent probably entirely too much time for a normal sane person researching whitetail glands uh-huh. <laughs> and, but understanding, see that alone, the amount of, once you start understanding how they're communicating with each other, mm-hmm as opposed to just stereotypes or theories on things. Yes. Holy cow. Yep. The, the Right there, the knowledge of how I was hunting things completely changed and mm-hmm. helped me tremendously. And a lot of that is obviously guys, well, companies trying to market specific products that are either easier for them to make or easier for them to get. I think that's where a lot of that misinformation maybe comes from as far as like uh, using certain scents in certain situations and why they work and different glands and stuff like that. Instead of like you're saying – just doing the research and, and figuring it out. But obviously you guys, yeah. um, you've developed a couple products and like, you know, kind of excited to see how they work this year. Tell us a little bit about your, your scent products and which one's your favorite. If you have a favorite, I rotate through multiple ones and I have all sorts of theories on that. And mm-hmm. I do say theories on that one because I, I try to, there, as much as it's a wild animal, I try to give certain things as most controlled variables when I'm testing like scrapes out and rubs and everything to mm-hmm. see how they're acting with it. Um, but really what the b- basis of those is white tails aren't using necessarily urine half as much as what people think they're using urine for. And so that, that originally used to be the communication factors, whether it's using urine or whether they were uh, vocally communicating with each other. And all those, some of those are true. And you're, they, yeah, they can communicate somewhat through urine. Once you start breaking it down, they're saying about tenfold the amount of things that they can say in urine through a gland. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, like the one that is the easiest for me to understand is there. There's a gland in between their hooves, their two hooves, yep. and all four legs, and that's the interdigital. Mm-hmm. And the interdigital is typically like when people when people see a doe or a buck stomping at you. There's, we all know that we've heard probably just about everything of why they're stomping at you, whether it's they're trying to scare you or they're trying to get you to move or they're just scared. I don't know. But the real reason behind that is because when they step down, when they stomp hard enough, they're actually releasing significantly more interdigital gland, that, that oil onto the ground. Mm-hmm. And so now when another deer walks up to it and it lasts for multiple hours, right. another deer comes and smells a lot more of that interdigital right there. They mm-hmm. know that there's something wrong. They there's know a, Jeff's in the woods. Warning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we could start calling it the Jeff gland. There you <laughs> go. We should. Um, but, and so where I learned that originally is because each inner, each deer, every single time they take a footstep, they're leaving a little bit of interdigital behind. Mm-hmm. And so every time you see like a buck, when people call them bird dogging or something, they got their nose to the ground, they're running around, is them smelling another deer's track or scent. Right. Because it's the same, it's same exact thing as if I were to walk up to one of you guys and hand you my, my license, my driver's license. Yep. You're going to get just, just about every bit of information off of me as you can on a surface level. Mm-hmm. Now, there's even more in depth than that. When they smell that interdigital, or they smell their forehead gland, any, really any of them are saying multiple things, but that interdigital will tell them their direction, the health of the animal, the, the gen, or gender of mm-hmm. this, the deer, and whether they're close to being in heat or are in heat. So right. simply putting their nose down, they're not smelling the urine. They're not, they're not walking around trying to see where a doe or another buck peed here or there. Right, right. They're using all these different things. Same thing with scrapes. Like when yep. they scrape on the ground, that's interdigital. When they rub their face in the tree, they're using their preorbital and their forehead and their salivary. Mm-hmm. And so all those things, when you start observing, you start to understand where the glands are located. You start observing what these white tails are doing. You're like, why is he rubbing on the tree? Right. Well, there's, he's rubbing a gland on the tree. Yep. He's putting it on there. Why did he lick the tree? Same thing. And yep. so 
there's there's tons and tons and tons to learn once you actually start diving into it and using it to your advantage and things and man that's the the sense for us was that was the main thing of let's make something that they're actually communicating with genuinely not just go put a bottle under a dough and a fence at peas right, <laughs> right spray it out there yep so yeah that's interesting there about the scrapes too like you're talking about because you'll see a lot of guys talking about either well they always pee in a scrape or this one didn't pee in a scrape and why didn't he well it, they actually you know a good part of the time they won't they come and they'll either hit that licking branch to get all that scent that you're talking about or they come in and they'll smell the ground where all that inner digital is at and they're just there's so much more to it than just urine but i think oh, yeah i think that's a product of the market and how it has been for so long is maybe that's the easiest thing for companies to sell or collect and sell or reproduce at that for that matter oh 100 percent. if you talk to a game farm too you can first off they're collecting urine all 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 times of the year mm -hmm. but it's a lot of them actually will have facilities where they can bring their whitetails into a room and they'll leave these does and bucks and stuff in there for a certain amount of time and they control the lighting in there so mm -hmm. it's artificial how much sunlight and they can put them into heat anytime they want right so now they don't they don't have to wait till it is actually season for mm -hmm. them to get the proper in heat urine they can just do it beforehand make all their their urine and send it out so it's a heck of a lot easier than getting glands yeah no doubt no doubt so you've obviously been in the outdoor industry and on the outdoor channel for a long time so not any family members who is your favorite personality that either you've met or that you that you watch on the outdoor channel outside of Ray's Tony, Jim, obviously Jim Shockey okay the great one. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah oh yeah it's, that's an easy one he, I never really watch I didn't enjoy watching shows that much when I was a young kid mm -hmm. but for whatever reason when he came on every single show that he would put out there I was watching just because it's he, he was different he yep. was really down to earth yep and some of the freaking hunts he does is just absolutely insane. Oh, crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No doubt. So you probably know this. I, maybe, maybe you don't. A lot of people I don't think. He used to be an underwear model. Jim Shockey Yeah, did. I didn't know that. <laughs> I figured you probably did. <laughs> I didn't know that, yep. Jeff. Did you know that? No, I, I don't give a, I don't care if I know you know. <laughs> I heard, uh, I heard a story have... about it one time. Go ahead. Nah, well, it wasn't my story, so I don't want to butcher it. <laughs> Well, it, do you guys uh, do you guys have Apple Music? Yes. Yep. Well, I bet you didn't. Or maybe you did. He has released music. Okay. Yeah. So if you can yeah. look up you knew Jim that? Shockey. Yep. Okay, I didn't know that. There's, it, you got to have the taste for it. That's for damn sure. <laughs> but <laughs> not gonna lie, I mean, even if the music isn't my style quite, quite or quite my style, he does have a pretty impressive voice for me thinking he's just some bear hunter or something. Right. <laughs> just some Canadian bushman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. 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 Well, that's interesting. I did not know that either. There's a, definitely yeah, a lot of uh, interesting people out there. And I think it's uh, yeah. there's a lot of misconceptions or stereotypes about guys that are on TV. Like a lot of people, and maybe it's just out of jealousy or like, well, they've just had everything handed to them. They didn't, like they came from this or whatever, and they didn't have to work for anything. But even yeah. someone in your situation who kind of grew up into it, like I'm sure you weren't just handed the keys and here you go, you know, and obviously cause you oh, wow. left it for a little while and went to work in construction. There's a lot of interesting characters in the industry and that you see on TV that are just normal guys down to earth that just got root. I mean, they've been hunting for a long time and they've honed their craft and they've got personality to do it. Uh, and there's, I think that, there's a lot of that. There's, there's quite a few of them that are out there that if you get to know who they are, they're just deep, genuine hunters, just like you and me. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that you got to preface that too, because there's your fair share that is not. Oh yeah, that is not. Uh, it's great when you go to meet them in person. It's like, come on, man, why you got to be like that? <laughs> right, but right. That's you're going to find you know, that just about every industry. Yeah. That's so. what I was going to ask, without naming names, if there were uh, any people that you had seen or thought would be cool to meet, and then met them and were like, oh my god. <laughs> Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's been there's been a couple. But it's, <laughs> I mean, you can name yeah, names if you want to, but I'm not going to make it. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that one. Okay, yeah, I think that's probably a good call. <sighs> yeah, that's there's an interesting aspect to that for sure, and then I assume that like everything else has to do with money as well. You wonder how some guy that could be that big of a jerk can get to the point they got to, but I thought of it probably does have to do with money. But it is good to see that. 
there are other guys who, like you said, just like us, or just hunters that really enjoyed it, that got into it. Um, you know, some of the biggest guys in the industry just got into it pretty humble beginnings and to see where they're at now and what they're doing. Like I have yeah. no, no ill judgment or anything towards what they're doing now because they built up to that. Yep. Well, I, and it goes the, I've had the opposite as well. So like I've had, I, there's been a couple that I've met that you see them on TV, you see them in YouTube videos and TikTok and everything. You're like, what are you doing? Like, why are you trying to represent things like this? Right. But then you turn around, you meet them in person and goodness gracious, do they not give hunters a great name? But at the same time you meet them in person, they're just genuinely a good person that doesn't think things through all the time. Right. Maybe so, doesn't have the best yeah. judgment. Yeah. So, you, so yeah. you have both. I mean, you have the guys that are good and bad. And Almost like naming a show person. above the rest or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I've heard those guys are pieces of crap. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, man. <laughs> yeah. I, They're good. There's definitely, in every industry, there's people like that for sure that you – that. Again, even on that side of it, you think this guy kind of seems like a jerk, but then you meet him in person. There's so I went to school in St. Louis, and I knew several guys that worked uh, like in the clubhouse for the Cardinals and all that. And you see these ball players on TV, and you go, "Man, he just seems like a jerk." The way he plays, and I just can't stand to watch him. And then I'll ask these guys because they'll interact with him, like, "No, no, he's like the greatest dude on the planet." You know, they have great things to say about yeah. him. And then there's the opposite too. So it's like that in everything. Oh yeah, can't get away from it. Nope. And here's probably I, a, I just try to be me. That's about it. Yep. I think <laughs> yeah. that's the best thing. Off camera. There's yeah. there's definitely an appetite for authenticity. When, oh, whether 100%. it be on outdoor channel or on YouTube or just in the the hunting entertainment industry because there are those shows that, you know, are they seem just really produced and guys think they're fake or maybe some of them are you know they just there's not a lot yeah. of authenticity to it and i think there's a big appetite for that right now which is i think part of the reason the popularity of some of the public land guys yeah and i and i guess so over the years like i said we've been doing it for I mean, we've been doing it longer than 10 years but to begin with we started as a like this is a family hunting show and this is just that genuineness and that authentic yet over the years you start to if you don't kind of update and change some things it starts to go away a little bit as far as people recognizing that. Well, the past couple of years and mainly the past year, we've really put that at the forefront of, look, we're going to, we're going to do this type of video solely because we know that, w that we found something out. We found some great tip and we're going to share that with people. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, the amount of people that like we already had a decent sized fan fan base and following in the past year, we've been bigger than ever simply for the fact that some we put ourselves out there in different ways we've related with a lot more people because we are the way they are too. We just never really put it out there that, that, that well. Mm -hmm. And so you just saying the fact that the authentic is a, a very large thing right now, people are looking for it because I think there's so many things in the world right now that is, you don't even go on social media half the time and think, Oh, this is something legit or this is something true or real right. because everything's fake. And yep. so it's refreshing. Yeah, it is for sure. Uh, so who are some of the most interesting? Have you met Jim Shockey? I have. Okay. Yeah. So obviously it, he's on that list, I guess. But who are some more of the more interesting guys that either people would think or or wouldn't think would be uh, interesting to meet? One of my, surprisingly, one of my favorites is, and because he's, I feel like he's a hit or miss with some people. I thoroughly enjoy, I've met the Reeves family multiple times, mm -hmm. Driven. Yeah. And yep. number one, Pat is a character. In <laughs> yeah. Place. So yeah. If you get talking to him, he's pretty funny. Right. But their kid, oh my God, Carson. <laughs> yeah. That, not that he's necessarily, he, well, he is up there. He's been doing it with his dad for he's about the same thing as us. Right. And that kid is one of the biggest characters I've ever met in my life. <laughs> yeah. We, we were in a show in, uh, I think Minnesota is where it was. And it was very slow. It was very boring show. Mm -hmm. And he, at the time, he was like, I don't know, 12, maybe 12. 
and one of the electric bike companies let him hop on one of their bikes. <laughs> and so he's driving around the show like, yeehaw, having all this grand old time and everything, and wrecks into the Swarovski booth. <laughs> shatters, shatters all the glass, all the binoculars and spotting scopes oh, goes geez. everywhere and everything. And his dad is like freaking, <laughs> like, what are we going to do? We can't pay for all this and everything. And the, the Swarovski guy's like, oh, don't worry about it. I think it's going to be all right. And they picked it all up like, well, this is a testament to our product. Even one of the reeds could run into it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You need those kind of guys around. Oh, hundred percent. It makes because a lot of times you end up being at some of these shows and things with the same people. It's just in a different mm-hmm. place, and mm-hmm. so you get to know some of them pretty well, and it it becomes a lot more fun. Yep. When you're around people that are, you actually get to know them a little bit and stuff. Yeah, no doubt. Because yeah. we've all been to those shows that maybe it's like good for a few hours on Saturday or something, but the rest of it you're just sitting there like. Looking at oh, your yeah. watch. <laughs> yeah, I need somebody to entertain me. <laughs> yep, yep, no doubt. And it's the same way in hunting camp. If you got that guy that can keep you entertained, because we've all had slow weeks or whatever it is, or slow days in the stand, if you got someone with some personality, that that character, it goes a long For way. Sure. Yep. It helps out a lot. Yep. So I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Before I get you out of here, though, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you, where they can find your podcast, and then the raised hunting as well, like socials, uh, website, anything else you want to shamelessly plug now's the time to do it <laughs> i got you <laughs> well me you can just search up easton holder anywhere and pretty much any social media platforms you'll find me not that i'm too entertaining to find but um as far as race hunting goes same thing type us in anywhere a podcast we have just about every platform we got youtube uh, uh spotify apple music mm-hmm. um is that just anywhere. Uh, that is, raised hunting podcast yep the okay. raised hunting podcast okay. and in that it, we i mean if you guys have anything or anybody, we love having suggestions for topics and stuff. So for sure. Um, and then our YouTube, we actually, we've gotten it down to the point where we can do a lot of our, we don't have to wait like a year to, in order to air uh, like our current hunts and stuff on the outdoor channel. And so our YouTube is a great place for people to go and kind of keep up with mm-hmm. us in, in the, in the moment type of deal and see some of the hunts we're going on or successes, fails, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the only other thing is that you guys, I think, would be of in, interested of it. We didn't talk about it at all, but we do have a Raised It Full Draw, which is a nonprofit organization. It's a kids camp that we do. Okay. And that is, we bring 50 kids in every year, and we got it in six different states now. Um, but the kids walk out with their, in, in short, they walk out with their bow hunter certification and everything, and they get to learn basically, we're talking about new hunters, they get mm-hmm. to learn everything from start to finish. That's so, awesome. Um, and that's just, like I said, raise the full draw. They can find okay. that on the raise counting website or anything and okay. keep an, keep an eye out for the hype sticks. Those for sure. Guys, you guys will see that coming out here pretty soon. So for sure. that one's going to be big. I will link all that stuff in the description of the episode as well. So it'll make everybody that's listening, it'll make it a little easier for you to find, um, you okay. just go to the description and, and find that. Dad's got one more question for you too here. So before you get out of here, Let's I just it. got a question. Do you know, were you named after Jim Easton and the aluminum company or, or do you have any idea of if your dad just liked the Easton name or what? Arrows. Yep. There you go. <laughs> I, I wonder. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Yep. I get that question so often. People either ask if it's just a just the name or a bat or an arrow. You know, <laughs> well, I, I figured it was arrows, but Easton makes a lot of different aluminum products. So. Oh yeah, they yeah. do. All right, well, cool. People get mad at me when I don't shoot Easton arrows. Like, <laughs> you're, you're named after them, but you don't shoot them. Right. <laughs> right. Well, you yeah. Know. And there's a lot of you good didn't pick out your there. own name though. You can't help that. Exactly. That's what I'm <laughs> yeah, saying. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, we'll let you get out of here. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I know you got a busy schedule. Uh, appreciate you coming on. And if you ever want to do it again, man, let us know. We'd love to have you back. Heck yeah, man. I had a lot of a lot of good, a lot of fun. So thank you guys for having me. And I'll probably go listen to my own voice when you guys post it. So. <laughs> for <laughs> sure, man. I'll let you know. I'll let you know when it comes out. Perfect. All right. Thanks, man. All right, guys. Take care, Easton. Yep. yep. Have a good one. <laughs>